Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thanks to all of you that uh, battled the conditions to get here this morning. And thank you to Dr. Chang for being here. Maybe she can correct me along the way if there's any uh, errors on the slide. So um, before I start, I just want to get a show of hands from the residents here, the select few residents who are here. <clears throat> can you just show me who's actually performed a trust biopsy? Some senior residents? Um, what about a transperineal? Again, seniors, senior residents only, right? So, um, so that'll be good because I've got a few slides during the talk outlining actually how to do it. So, how many have had digitally directed prostate aspirations? What about digitally, <laughs> digitally guided biopsies? You had aspirations to biopsies? <laughs> And digitally guided biopsies as well. Was, we stopped doing that at the time yeah. that you and Zeke took a prostate and there was no cancer in it. <laughs> yeah, the, 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 the histology came back as a glove finger glove, right? <laughs> Invasively text. That's right. So, um, uh, well, it's customary for fellows to put up photos of their hometown, I guess. So, this is a photo, an aerial shot of Auckland uh, for those of you that have not been there. You can see it's got a harbour and a bridge going across the northern parts. So very similar to Vancouver on a smaller scale, of course. And uh, we have scenery in New Zealand much similar to what you have in BC. You could say this is a photo taken from the Howe Sounds easily. It's uh, from Milford Sound in the South Island of New Zealand. That's right. That's right. Where are we? Orcs. So what are we going to cover today? Um, I'll start off by talking a little bit about trust biopsy and whether or not this should still be the go-to option. We're going to outline some pitfalls and ways to improve on that. We're then going to move on to transperineal biopsy and really whether it should be utilized more or not, and I'll try and answer that question. Then we're going to go on to MRI and the million dollar question is, is this accurate enough? And then moving on to finally uh, MRI guided biopsies, so whether this should be now the new gold standard moving forward. So we know the current prostate cancer diagnostic pathway in terms of elevated PSA, plus minus abnormal DRE, then getting a trust biopsy has been in place for several decades. <clears throat> there are some obvious issues with this, uh, not to mention <clears throat> from a tolerability point of view, but you can see here on the diagram on the right there, there's obvious areas which are not often targeted uh, with the standard a transrectal ultrasound guided prostate biopsy. So there are issues with misdiagnosis, underdiagnosis, um, overtreatment of low risk disease, uh, as well as undertreatment from potentially sampling errors. Uh, you might think that this is a photo of a patient wondering what to do after a consultation, but it's actually in fact a photo of a urologist who's just had a patient admitted to the intensive care unit following post biopsy sepsis, and the histology eventually turned out to show no cancer. So we know that the current model is not perfect. A few things we need to work on. Uh, number one, we need to omit screening in patient unlikely to benefit or unwilling to undergo treatment, such as those who have a life expectancy of less than 10 years. We need to improve on our specificity and minimize number of negative biopsies and minimize detection of low risk cancers. We can also improve our sensitivity by maximizing detection of clinically significant cancers, and I'll talk a little bit more about that as we go through. And last but not least, we need to reduce harms of a biopsy. We know there are several trust biopsy-related complications. The bleeding ones are obviously common, but luckily they're all self-limiting. What I want to focus on down the bottom there in bold is the risk of sepsis, which has been rising worldwide. Several people have postulated that it may be due to increased uh, fluoroquinolone resistant antibiotic uh, bacteria, sorry, antibiotic use, traveling, etc. So several ways we can improve biopsy safety and tolerability, uh, analgesia from a patient point of view. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time on this, it's an old topic, uh, it's been well uh, studied. From an infection point of view, we talked about the rising uh, rate of sepsis, and we'll talk, a few, uh, talk about a few ways to improve on this going forward. This is old data showing that periprostatic nerve blocks still work, and that is still the gold standard. Um, <clears throat> a lot of people have looked at different ways to improve 
tolerability, such as using inhalational agents, perirectal preparations, uh, but the periprostatic nerve block is still the current our gold standard. From an infection point of view, our main aim with antibiotic prophylaxis is to avoid sepsis, hospitalization. For the standard patient who are not at risk, probably will be fine by getting away with just using standard fluoroquinolone antibiotics. But we know that fluoroquinolone resistant bacteria is on the rise, uh, so therefore using local antibiotic resistance data, minimizing antibiotic use uh, is important. Several strategies that other people have used. So in 2016, a systematic review was published looking at targeted prophylaxis based on pre-biopsy rectal swabs. So everyone who you think you're going to order, or who you are planning to order a truss biopsy on, gets a pre-biopsy rectal swab. Looking specifically for fluoroquinolone resistant bacteria, if they did have that, then they end up getting a targeted uh, antibiotics such as keftriaxone, phosphomycin. Uh, and they've shown that they reduced the infection and sepsis rates from around 2 to 5 percent down to less than 1 percent in over 4,500 biopsies. A Rod Studd, a previous fellow here in his group in Wellington, uh, found similar rising rates of sepsis in Wellington and have decided in conjunction with the infectious diseases uh, team there to use an augmented uh, or alternative prophylactic uh, in terms of uh, ertapenem routinely for all patients undergoing a truss biopsy. And in their 300 uh, patient series, they've had no sepsis thus far. Jeremy Grummet, another previous fellow here uh, in Melbourne, Australia, have switched to performing transperineal biopsies for everybody. Uh, and in a series published in 2014 of 240 patients, again, zero sepsis. The last I heard him speak in 2016, his series has gone up to about 800 now, and still zero sepsis uh, with a single dose IV Cafazolin on induction. Jason, with the with Rod Studd's paper that he you know didn't drop those letter, the you know the, the reviewer and then the comment back. Do you remind us again in terms of follow up of his series to look at changes in bacterial flora? Because you know erdipenum and you know like we're like I'm always after resonance about erdipenum and and uh, hypatazo because you know someone has a minor fever and they put on hypatazo. Right. It's we're we're really the, the medical microbiology sent to hate mail once a week because <laughs> yeah. of this because it's being so overutilized. So what are they doing to go in and sort of follow up? Because they've just done a snapshot in time. That's we right. Don't know what's happened to that patient cohort in terms of their their bacterial flora. Yeah. So they've been doing this for about three years now, and uh, recently they've published on performing follow-up rectal swabs to see if you can uh, you have <coughs> increased rates of carbapenem resistant bacteria in their flora and have shown that compared to match controls there is no uh, increase thus far but we're only at the early stages right that's obviously a concern um, so a little bit about transrectal ultrasonography so patients usually position the left lateral position a rectal exam is performed ultrasound probe is placed local anesthetic injected Prostate volume is measured, and one should scan for any hypoechoic lesions, calcifications, abscesses. And typically, the peripheral zone <coughs> is targeted uh, on the first biopsy. And you can see here the peripheral zone is on the bottom here. And the axial view, slightly hypoechoic hypo, uh, <coughs> compared to the rest of the prostate. And a standard template is 12 cores, so 6 and plus 6 lateral cores, focusing primarily on the peripheral zone. And usually the anterior zone and the transitional zones are omitted on the initial biopsy. And you can see here on the diagram, uh, there's obvious uh, areas which are undersampled or not sampled at all, uh, such as that of the anterior zone or apical peripheral. So needless to say, there are some issues with the truss biopsy. It's still unpleasant under a local anesthetic. There are bleeding risks, rising risk of sepsis, sampling errors, and what do you do if the patient has a negative biopsy and the PSA uh, keeps changing? The question then you have to ask yourself is if you had an elevated PSA, would you volunteer and go for a trust biopsy as the first line uh, investigation of choice? Moving on to transperineal biopsies, it's done across surgically prepped clean skin with negligible urosepsis, allows for comprehensive sampling, 
Uh, and if you talk to patients who've had both transperineal versus truss biopsy, most would prefer transperineal. It allows for MR targeting, uh, just like the truss. Some current indications for transperineal biopsies, uh, rising PSA with previous negative biopsies. And more and more people are using it in active surveillance uh, before their confirmatory biopsy uh, or for interval assessment. Some people using it for discordance between parameters and others using it for, to confirm treatment failure, especially in the setting of post-radiotherapy when you're considering salvage uh, therapy. The question is whether one should be using it for primary biopsy. I'll talk a bit more about that. There are some obvious downsides to transperineal biopsy. It's definitely more expensive compared to the truss equipment and training required, as well as time in the OR. It's mostly done under a general anaesthetic. You can do it under a local anaesthetic. There are some small series out of the UK. It's difficult and limited data. <clears throat> Most people are doing it under a general anaesthetic still. There's obvious issues of diagnosis of very low-risk prostate cancers when you're taking 30, 40 cores from a prostate. The NICE guidelines currently uh, endorse it in patients with suspected cancer who have had negative or equivocal results from other biopsy methods. What about other guidelines? Uh, the EAU... How do you balance this from an OR resource point of view? I assume the system or access to the Yeah, well, that's, that's a good question. It does take up all our time and does increase the wait list, but uh, we, we do it in, in a system where, uh, similar to what you have in UBC, where it's quick turnover, that allows for you know, up to 10 to 14 uh, biopsies done in a day, and we try to list them all so that patients are you know, fast-flowing, but you know, there, there is an issue. It increases the weightless, that's why it's more resource intensive. Um, the AUA has no statement on, on this. Uh, this hmm? Yeah, no doubt. Um, the CUA uh, currently uh, says that the saturation biopsies may be considered in high-risk cases. Uh, patients with two previous negative biopsies, although they don't spe specify whether it should be done transperineally or transrectally. So the setup for this, usually patients are positioned in lithotomy. A transrectal ultrasound probe is placed. Uh, and you generate an image that looks like this on the axial view with these coordinates. And it's kind of like playing battleship. Right, so if you want to hit this uh, peripheral zone at the base here, you go B1, B and a half one, C1. So some templates of um, uh, transperineal biopsy. This is just a template from the Guy's Hospital in the UK. And you can see that uh, sort of systematic uh, overview of the cores they take. And in terms of numerical um, cores, it, it uh, depends on the prostate size. The larger your prostate, the more cores they take uh, for obvious reasons. So patient, all patients have a full assessment. It's done under a day case, under a general anaesthetic. No bowel prep or catheter is required. And typically, uh, antibiotic use uh, is single-dose cofazolin. What are the actual complications? So you can see the retention rate is about 2%. Hematuria needing omission, UTI are pretty rare. Uh, Eurosepsis is zero from this series out of the UK. And there are 600 patients. What about outcomes? So in about 174 patients with previous negative biopsy, uh, they found that they had cancer at about 36%. <coughs> and half of those found with cancer were actually clinically significant cancers with Gleason score 7 or above. 300 patients who were on active surveillance based on their trust biopsy were upgraded. Uh, these weren't upgraded because of volume, but they actually upgraded to Gleason 7 or more disease and went on to definitive treatment. And those are those 150 patients who had primary transperineal biopsies for one reason or another. 54% uh, were found to have cancer, and again, around about or just over half had Gleason 7 or more disease. Interesting to know that about 15% of patients had disease exclusively in the anterior zone, which one would assume would be missed on a truss biopsy. So, who do I think should have a transperineal biopsy in 2017, 2018? 
those patients are at increased risk of sepsis. Those patients who you consider ordering a second truss biopsy on, I think you have to ask yourself, are you just doing the same thing and expecting a different result? Those patients potentially on active surveillance uh, who uh, are thinking about having a confirmation biopsy, especially those who have an MRI, sort of equiv equivocal MRI, in terms of ruling out any MRI invisible disease. Those patients with anterior or apical lesions, if you didn't have access to MR targeted uh, methods. Patients with large gland or other high risk patients uh, with equivocal uh, MRIs. So if you had an elevated PSA, would you rather have a transperineal or truss? Or would you rather have this? So what is an MRI scan of the prostate? How it works? Just very briefly, as I'm not a radiologist, maybe Dr. Chan can add a bit more uh, here. Um, so a multi-parametric MRI is required. So several different uh, sequences, T1 and T2 weighted imaging, as well as diffusion weighted imaging, which is probably the more important uh, of the three. Um, it looks at the diffusion of water molecules through tissue and in areas of cancer uh, the diffusion is restricted uh, and an ADC or apparent diffusion coefficient uh, map can be generated and there are some good data showing the lower the ADC value that the uh, higher the grade of uh, Gleason grade with positive correlation. Dynamic contrast enhancement is the last one, uh, probably the least important of the three, nevertheless required. Uh, looks at the uptake of, of gadolinium-based uh, contrast on the arterial face. A 3 Tesla MRI is preferred for better resolution, but not absolutely necessary. A 1.5 Tesla will do. Uh, uh, indirect or coil is optional. The trained radiologist then looks at the MRI scan and marks out regions of interest or areas of suspicion. And each lesion is then scored using the PIRADS uh, score, which stands for Prostate uh, Imaging uh, Reporting and Data System. Talk about that as well. So in pictorial form, top left you have the T2 weighted imaging in the axial view. Uh, typically the peripheral zone is hyper intense and uh, any areas of suspicion is a focus of hypo intensity as marked out here. It's easiest to read, it's anatomic. Uh, from the diffusion weighted imaging, uh, area of brightness here indicates areas of restricted diffusion. Uh, and if you look at the ADC uh, map imaging, it's usually a lower signal and low value correlates with high Gleason grade. On the dynamic contrast enhancement view, you see uptake of contrast on the arterial face. So the PIRAD score is out of five, one to five, five being very likely, very high likelihood of having clinically significant cancers, uh, one being very low, and three is indeterminate. Questions, when do we use the <coughs> parametric MRI? I guess these days it's more like when do we not use a multi-parametric MRI. Um, the NCCN guidelines recommend using it uh, for patients with rising PSA after a negative biopsy. More and more people are using it during active surveillance, especially before the co confirmation biopsy. Uh, a lot of people now are moving towards using it pre-biopsy. Is this justified? And I'll talk a bit more about that as we go through. Uh, and some are using it for local staging or operative planning in terms of guiding, <coughs> excuse me, guiding nerve spare. There are data showing that MRI will likely underestimate the disease, meaning that if the MRI showed uh, suspicious for extra capsular <coughs> extension, you should not uh, be perform performing a nerve spare uh, procedure. Whereas if the MRI showed no obvious evidence of extra capsular extension, you should still proceed with caution. <coughs> In terms of detection of recurrent disease, I think that's largely being replaced uh, with PSMA scans. For, for the Vancouver Prostate Center, is there, has there been a decline in the repeat biopsy of patients that are enrolled in active surveillance and that you're not doing that second biopsy in one to two years and you're just doing, say, serial MRIs looking for a change on MR? Because I, you know, I don't like to all my active surveillance do that, so I don't know what really happened. Yeah. And we've made a, a business case Forward uh, to increase the ability of 
Next slide, actually. All right, so I guess the question is how accurate. Oops, sorry. Um, no, I mean, yeah, it'll just mean more costs for MRI, but um, I think there are studies now looking to see how we can do the shortened exam time. There's some studies out there on a few year protocols, just back to DWI, where we abbreviated. Um, there's studies looking at can we do away with time passes. Time passes is not the most important sequence, it's really D2 and DWI. Um, most studies are saying that you can. Probably get away with quant pass. That's the most recent one. We we all be saying it's been quite helpful, not to get a prospective multi-center trial. So we need to kind of investigate that a little bit further. Uh, we looked at our own data, um, 1.5 um, over 100 lesions, and uh, we, we found that quant pass was essential. So we may be able to get away without quant pass in these patients. Because you do all the trusses here as well, mm -hmm. if an MRI can reduced number of trusses. I mean, is that <coughs> cost effectiveness of that? Does anyone look at that at all? The MRIs are funded, the number of them, the procedure base funded. Right? So it's, it, it's, it's block funding, which is why it's been an issue. Um, we don't see much of an issue with CT because it's unlimited funding um, to get funded patients to do actually do it's a technical thing. Unfortunately, with MRI, when it first came out in the 1980s, um, they had no idea. How important, how you know, how much it's grown, um, and they had cap funding, and we could always use up the limited cap funding within three months of the first year. And year every year, we have to apply to the ministry for additional. <coughs> Okay, so we'll move on to talk about how accurate a multi-parametric MRI really is. So this is the landmark uh, study published earlier this year in The Lancet from a UK group, the PROMISE trial, looking at um, diagnostic accuracy of the MRI versus a truss biopsy in prostate cancer. It's a paired validating confirmatory study, which uh, is classified as level 1B evidence for diagnostic tests. They looked at 576 men with elevator PSA who are biopsy naive. All of these men had a multi-parametric MRI, then a truss biopsy, and then a transperineal mapping biopsy at 5 millimeter uh, intervals under a general anesthetic, which they used as a reference standard, as not all of these men went on to have radical prostatectomy, so the transperineal mapping biopsy was the best histology they could get. The MRI report was blinded to the practitioner performing the biopsies, and significant cancer was classified as anything uh, Gleason 4 plus 3 or more, or maximum core length 6 millimeters or more. And they looked at the accuracy of truss biopsy versus the MRI. So top left is, uh, I don't know if you can read this, but top left showed the results from the MRI. So 576 patients, 418 was found to have a significant cancer, which is pyrads 3, 4, or 5 on MRI. Out of the 418 with a positive MRI, about half were found to have significant cancer on transperineal uh, biopsy, so about 50% false positive rate. 158 patients who were found to have no significant lesions on MRI, about 10% were found to have significant cancer on transperineal biopsy, so false negative of 10%. Looking at the trust biopsy results, uh, 124 patients had significant cancer, and not surprisingly, most of these were confirmed to have um, significant cancer again on transperineal biopsy. Out of the 450 patients who had no significant cancer on truss biopsy, about a third ended up having significant cancer on the transperineal biopsy, so false negative of about 33%. If you put that in um, table form, so you can see the MRI has a sensitivity of 93%, a negative predictive value of around 90%, as we said, 10% false negative rate. <coughs> 
Um, the trust biopsy, not surprisingly, does better in terms of the specificity and the positive predictive value as you're not really going to get any false positives from a trust biopsy. So used as a triage tool, so we know that multi-parametric MRI has significantly better sensitivity and negative predictive value for clinically significant cancers. It may allow 27% of patients to avoid a primary trust biopsy and diagnose less clinically insignificant cancers. We know that it has a high false positive, around 50%, so low specificity and low positive predictive value. Therefore, if the MRI is positive, a biopsy is still required to confirm the diagnosis. The question is, is this going to be a cost-effective method based on this data? Um, Emberton and his group uh, published this earlier this year at European Urology, um, looking at specifically this question, the cost-effectiveness of um, using this approach of MRI first. Through a series of complex modeling, they found that uh, using MRI first and up to two MRI targeted trust biopsies to take more clinically significant cancers per pound spent compared to a strategy using a trust biopsy first. They said that it's cost effective, and I have no idea how they came to the figure of £7,000 per quality of life year <coughs> gained. Um, uh, they do say there are some limitations, such as the accuracy of MRI targeted biopsy, the long term outcomes of men with clinically significant prostate cancer, uh, and so forth. So, really, uh, the question is still up in the air in terms of whether it could be used as a triage tool. Well, that's assuming it can be used as a triage tool. Well, then, is the MRI guided biopsy accurate enough when you compare it with a trust biopsy? So, this group uh, tried to answer that question. Uh, they looked at 223 biopsy naive men. Uh, with elevated PSA, all of which uh, had a multi-parametric MRI and a truss biopsy. Those patients with, with suspicious lesions, PIRADS 3 or above, also underwent an MR-guided biopsy. So they compared MR-guided biopsy with a truss biopsy, essentially, looking at prostate cancer det det detection. In terms of the results, about 63% of the cohort had cancer. The truss biopsy detected about 56% of patients with cancer, including about half of which had low risk disease. This is D'Amico low risk, uh, so Gleason 6. Um, MR guided biopsy detected about 99, uh, so 70% of patients, so 99 out of 142 uh, patients who had a suspicious MRI, uh, of which only 6% were low risk. So they found that the MR guided biopsy pathway reduced the need for biopsy by about 50% decrease the diagnosis of low-risk cancer by about 90% and increase detection of intermediate and high-risk cancers by 18%. So they found that the negative predictive value for the trusts and the MRI guided biopsies is showing there. And in terms of sensitivity, specificity, positive and negative predictive values, uh, the MRI guided biopsy not surprisingly outperforms the trust biopsy. <coughs> What I found in my own practice is that if the patients that I do send for biopsy, I'm getting fewer phone calls saying telling the patients that it's negative than than they have to go see Dr. Lee. You know, like it's just you know, I think that the percentage of positive biopsies has changed, and perhaps I'm 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 reticent to send like I'm more restrictive about sending for biopsy, and that's why the percentage is so high. Because 64 percent is high, right? For you know, for for biopsy night patients. Peter, what have you noted in your practice? Are the patients who send, you know, they get sent with an elevated PSA referral? Or? Yeah, I mean, when I was, when I was in the ER, I was training, it was when I looked at a box. Thank you. 
Not that I've seen. Really. I've got that. Yeah, got that come out. So um, there's some issues with MRI, uh, claustrophobia, metallic objects or limitations, and also lack of resources. MRI is obviously not available everywhere, and we need expert MRI radiologists to generate the same sort of level of accuracy. Um, and as mentioned before, there is a, a t 9 to 12 month wait list for an MRI here. Uh, so some would say having a good MRI is like having a good uh, cup of coffee. So you need a good machine, obviously. You need to have good patient selections. And you need a trained radiologist or barista. <laughs> flat white. For me, yeah. yeah, flat, flat white's the way. So moving on to MRI fusion biopsy, that combines the strength of each modality. Uh, you allow lesion identification on the MRI and also visually guided biopsy on the truss uh, view. So the MRI is uh, segmented and read by an expert radiologist and any areas of suspicion is marked out as region of interest as shown here. The ultrasound is then performed and a 2D image on the ultrasound is then reconstructed to a 3D uh, using software. And on the day of the biopsy, after the ultrasound has been acquired, uh, we perform fusion and registration of the MRI and truss using, uh, by matching key landmarks such as the urethra, seminal vesicles, pubic symphysis, or other cysts in the prostate that can be seen on both, both uh, modalities. So what, once the landmarks are identified and matched, uh, the, the images are then fused, which then allows the targets marked out on the MRI to be superimposed on the ultrasound model so that as the operator moves the ultrasound in real time, the lesion flashes up and say biopsy here, basically. This is what it looks like um, in real life. I guess this is not a video, just a, a static shot, but on the left you have an MRI view of the region of interest, and on the right you have the ultrasound view, view also shown here. So we know that uh, the models are uh, somewhat uh, rigid, but the prostate is mobile, the patient moves or breathes, and so therefore uh, requires a bit of tracking, adjustment and compensation on the operator's point of view, so there is a bit of a learning curve. How accurate uh, is it? So this group uh, published in European Urology, and again, um, uh, in, in patients who've had a prior negative biopsy, so th this would be a similar cohort to what we, 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 we uh, have here, so patients who had a previous negative biopsy, increased suspicion or, or uh, ongoing suspicion, gets an MRI and sub subsequently followed by an MRI guided biopsy. So in 105 uh, uh, patients, they, are, they've, they performed systematic 12-core biopsies as well as lesion-directed biopsies uh, on all <coughs> patients with grade 2 lesions or more, uh, and looking at detection of all uh, prostate cancer as well as clinically significant cancer, which they define as uh, Gleason 3 plus 4 or above. <laughs> or any uh, cancer with a core length of more than uh, 4 millimeters or more. They found uh, cancer in about 34% of the population, uh, of which 72% uh, were clinically significant cancer, and they found that the degree of suspicion on MRI was the most powerful predictor of significant cancer. So essentially the higher the, the grade on MRI uh, results in higher detection of both overall cancer as well as clinically significant cancer, so not surprising. When they looked at uh, the results from the systematic cause alone versus the targeted cause alone versus that combined, they found that systematic cause uh, missed about 40% of significant cancers. The MR targeted cause, whilst it catches most of the significant cancers, uh, but it's not completely, uh, not, not, not 100%, uh, and also the MR cause uh, resulted in very few insignificant cancers. However, combination still work the best uh, and therefore it's still the current recommendation to take both lesion directed as well as systematic uh, cores. This is a paper published in the JAMA in 2015 looking at uh, over a thousand men uh, who underwent both uh, MR ultrasound fusion guided biopsy uh, as well as a truss biopsy, uh, most of which were uh, had a previous biopsy, some were biopsy naive. About 170 men then went on to have radical prostatectomy with whole mouth pathology available. Their primary outcome was to look at detection of high-risk prostate cancer as well as low-risk uh, prostate cancer and the ability uh, to predict prostatectomy pathology.
So essentially they were comparing fusion versus standard biopsies and they found similar number of cancer diagnosed in both uh, methods, so the fusion and the standard. And in about 70% the risk category uh, matched in both the modalities but they found that the fusion biopsy diagnosed more high-risk cancers, fewer low-risk cancers, uh, and still missed a, a small number of Gleason 7 plus disease. When you look at the cross tabulation, um, on the top you have the uh, truss biopsy results going down. Whoops, sorry. On the left you have the MR results going across, and all the white boxes essentially mean that the risk agreement from, the both, uh, from both modalities were in agreement. And orange means that you're upgraded on fusion, uh, blue means you upgraded on truss. So you saw that, uh, you can see that the fusion biopsy diagnosed 17% fewer low risk disease, 30% uh, more high risk disease, uh, but still missed some uh, clinically significant cancers. When they looked at the sensitivity and specificity, uh, the targeted biopsies performed better than the standard biopsies, but combination is still uh, better. What about some local data? Uh, you can see some familiar names there, published in Euro Urological Oncology in 2015. Uh, 283 men in the Vancouver Prostate Centre had persistent suspicion of prostate cancer despite prior negative uh, trust biopsy. MRI was obtained in 112 patients uh, and they found a suspicious lesion in about 78% of cases. Uh, and subsequent to MR guided biopsy uh, were performed in 86 of those 88 cases and a matching cohort was selected for comparison looking at rate of diagnosis of cancer as well as <coughs> significant cancer uh, with a definition listed there. And we found that uh, the MR targeted biopsy <coughs> detected uh, both more uh, overall uh, cancer as well as more uh, significant uh, prostate cancer compared to men uh, without an MRI. And in about 10% of cases, MR biopsy detected uh, significant cancer that were missed on the standard course. And multivariate analysis revealed that the PIRAT score as well as PSA density uh, were significant predictors for significant prostate cancer detection. And the conclusion was that in patients with prior negative uh, trust biopsy, the MR targeted biopsy improves detection of all prostate cancer as well as uh, significant prostate cancer. So MR ultrasound fusion is not the only way to perform MR targeted biopsy. There are various other ways, such as inbore biopsy, uh, as well as cognitive fusion, uh, which basically means the, the urologist or the radiologist looks at the MRI, uh, remembers whether or tries to memorize where the lesion is, then performs a freehand ultrasound and uh, <coughs> take a biopsy where he or she believes the lesion uh, might be, which is better. So this systematic review answers that question, or tries to answer that question, published this year. They looked at 43 studies. Um, they they involved, uh, included studies uh, with MR-guided uh, in-bore biopsies, fusion biopsy, and cognitive biopsy, as well as combination. And most of the studies also had a trust biopsy to compare with. They found that there was no significant difference between any of the MR-guided techniques versus a trust biopsy for overall prostate cancer detection. However, the MR-guided techniques had a higher detection rate of clinically significant prostate cancer versus the truss biopsy and a lower yield of insignificant prostate cancer. So the same themes keep coming up. But for clinically significant prostate cancer detection specifically, there, were no, uh, there was no significant advantage of any one of the MRI-guided techniques over the other. <coughs> So in summary, we evaluated uh, several different prostate biopsy techniques. We talked about the increasing uh, rates of sepsis and truss biopsy and some ways to reduce this. And one of the ways is transperineal biopsy. <coughs> it definitely reduces the sepsis risk, but more resource intensive. There may be expanding indications here. We talked about uh, the fact that multi-parametric MRI makes it possible to identify clinically significant prostate cancer most of the time. Uh, and if you looked at MR-guided biopsies, it improves detection specifically for clinically significant disease. Targeted cause uh, reduced detection of low-risk cancer, but as we saw, we're probably not yet ready to be used uh, alone. Still requires targeted and systematic cause. And allows uh, targeting of disease in areas not traditionally uh, uh, targeted by the standard trust biopsy. There are some limitations such as learning curve, dedicated radiology service, cost and time. And that's all I have. Uh, I hope everyone has a Merry Christmas. Stay safe on the roads. <laughs>
Thank you.